Hello, welcome to the Monday, November 13th, 2017 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Xavier this weekend had a nice diary introducing a trick to learn more about certificates installed in Windows. Turns out with a PowerShell, you have a virtual device cert colon that essentially leads to the certificate store and can be easily used to enumerate all trusted root certificates. The reason this is important is that we had it happen several times, usually a couple times a year, where malware and sometimes actually also intentionally installed software like drivers do install additional root certificates. And then, of course, an attacker could use these certificates to sign additional certificates that your operating system will trust. So taking stock of these root certificates occasionally certainly makes sense. Personally, I'm not a big fan of removing any certificates that are installed by the operating system by default. What you're risking there is that your users will get warning messages if they visit legitimate sites. On the other hand, that's a real good trick that uh, was provided in one of the comments. You can also monitor this passively. For example, Pro extracts all certificates it sees an SL traffic and then you can easily review who signed these certificates, who were the certificate authorities and look for anomalies here. And Google published an interesting study showing how Google accounts are hijacked. Well, it shouldn't really be a big surprise. There's sort of three ways how this is done. First of all, if details about an account are being leaked in another breach and the user did reuse passwords, that's one reason. The most successful, the most important way, however, appears to be phishing. And I was a little bit surprised about the success rate. There stating that 12 to 25 percent of phishing and keylogger attacks yield a valid password. I'm not 100% sure how they count that if uh, this is only among people that actually responded to the phishing scam or if this is everybody that received the phishing email. So between phishing, keyloggers, and reused credentials, what Google found is that phishing is really the number one reason how accounts are being exposed and hijacked. To defend against this, of course, some passive monitoring can work. If, for example, a login happens from an unusual location, and I have experienced this myself in one of my Honeypot accounts, when someone all of a sudden tried to log in from Nigeria, Google did actually block the login request. The recommended fix, of course, is still two-factor authentication. Now, Google mentions that some of the phishing attacks try to take this into account and try to learn more about the user, like phone numbers and the like, in order to possibly have a chance to bypass two-factor authentication. And two-factor authentication is certainly not bulletproof, but does prevent a significant hurdle for the attacker. Now, when it comes to actually fighting back on these phishing emails, one way you can help your users here is to make it easier to identify where the email is coming from. Some modern mail clients don't necessarily make that easy, but if they do, please enable these features. And we do have a blog post by Boyan about just this issue and how, for example, Gmail here does help users to identify that an email was not sent from a source that's authenticated to actually send emails for this domain. Of course, as the owner of the domain, you definitely do want to implement tools like SPF, DKIM, and with that DMARC, I've already mentioned them several times in this podcast before. And Robert Hickey with the Department of Homeland Security revealed at last week's CyberSat Summit that apparently about a year ago, a team of researchers was successful to hack the flight controls of a Boeing 757. Now, this happened, of course, in a controlled environment. The plane was actually parked on the ground, but the team had no physical contact to the plane and also didn't have an inside or anything like that place things like USB sticks on the plane. 
Details are very limited about this particular attack, but it doesn't appear to involve Wi-Fi. What this more sounds like is that they use something like a software-defined radio or something like this to actually interact with the avionics on the plane by essentially sending signals that the plane would typically expect from the ground. Now, of course, we have heard stories like this uh, before. Many of them involved actually a passenger on the plane connecting, for example, via Ethernet jacks that were exposed or using the in-flight Wi-Fi equipment in order to attack the plane or the entertainment system, which often wasn't uh, properly isolated from critical flight control systems. I don't remember an attack that actually demonstrated the use of uh, these avionics uh, protocols in order to attack a plane. Now, uh, given that uh, this particular talk was given at a satellite uh, conference, often uh, these particular signals are transmitted via satellites uh, to planes in flight. So uh, the attack does require a bit more infrastructure than your standard Wi-Fi attack. So at this point, I would rate this more as a nation state level attack. Of course, in the demonstration, they had the airplane on the ground and it would certainly be possible for a passenger on the plane to launch such an attack. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.